Thank you, everybody, for coming. Um, I, it is my pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Michael J. Bruce. Uh, he and I met uh, now about six months ago yeah, I know. at Health 2.0. And uh, he, more than anybody I've ever met, is a charismatic uh, evangelist for the power of sleep. And he uh, is able to bridge the divide between technology, industry, academia, um, more seamlessly than anybody I'd met. And that's why he's uh, helping us set up this sleep week. Uh, he's been responsible for many of the ideas around uh, evangelizing uh, that our team has around evangelizing sleep at Google. And uh, I'm, we'll give it off to him so that he can talk to you. Perfect. Thank you so much, Joe. I appreciate it. All right. So how's everybody doing today? Good. All right, who in the audience got a fantastic night of sleep last night, got as much sleep as they could possibly want, and have woken up feeling completely energized and ready to go? One person, two, three people out of, out of several. OK, so, so we know that sleep is a big deal, right? especially at a place like Google. Um, so that's what I'm here to talk about. But you know, if you've been watching during the week, and first of all, thank you everybody for participating in Sleep Week. It's been pretty amazing. Uh, we've had some incredible, incredible speakers. Smith Johnston, flight surgeon for NASA. Fred Maxick, one of the preeminent leaders, over 400 patents in the lighting industry. So light and sleep, and how do those kind of work together? Um, we've also been at, very fortunate to have sponsorships through Sleep Score. Um, and through Sleepio. So we've had some really great opportunity for people to see new technology, check it out, have a lot of fun with it. So today, I'm gonna talk about something that's a little bit different. I'm gonna talk to you about something called circadian rhythms. And what do they mean? Joe's favorite word, circadian. And, and what can we learn from them to be able to help us not only be able to sleep better at night, but in our daily living. And so my newest book is called The Power of When. Uh, and it looks at a couple of different things. But before I start, I thought what I would do is really talk to you about what is sleep and sort of how does it work to give you kind of the basic parameters from which to work. So this slide looks a little bit complicated, but it's really not. So it turns out that there are two distinct systems in the brain for sleep. Uh, one of them is a drive, kind of like hunger. So I'm hungry, I'm hungry, I'm hungry. I eat something and that hunger begins to dissipate. The same holds true with sleep. What we find is that there's something in our brain uh, that makes us sleepier and sleepier, and it's called adenosine. Adenosine is actually a byproduct of cells. So when a cell eats a piece of glucose, something comes out the back end. Part of what comes out the back end is adenosine. And adenosine works its way through the bloodstream, gets into the brain, and it goes to a very specific receptor site, specifically for adenosine. And as that builds up, we get sleepier and sleepier and sleepier. Now, why all this talk about neurochemistry? Well, it turns out that if you look at the molecular structure of adenosine and you look at the molecular structure of caffeine, they're off by one molecule, right? So here's what happens is when you're getting tired and you're putting down the coffee or the energy drinks or what have you, that actually goes and it fits really nicely into that receptor site and it blocks the adenosine. But then once your brain burns through the caffeine, the adenosine comes flooding in and that's where you get that caffeine crash because it's all that adenosine that's actually now made its way through the floodgates. So that's sleep drive. We want adenosine to raise at a very consistent level, get to a certain point. Usually around 10, 30, 11 o'clock at night, it kind of reaches its max, and that's when most people fall asleep. But that's not the only aspect of sleep. There's also a circadian rhythm. So the circadian rhythm is a lot, it's really your biological clock. And what I mean by that um, is kind of like with hunger as well. So you ever notice how you get hungry with breakfast, lunch, and dinner about the same time? So the same holds true with sleep, is you have this circadian system, and this actually makes you want to get sleepier at particular times, irrespective of adenosine. So how many people in here, by a raise of hands, have ever had the situation where you're exhausted? You are absolutely dog tired. You've had the worst, horrible, crazy day. And you're physically, all you can do is crawl into bed. And you get into bed, let's say, at 8 o'clock at night because you're just so exhausted. Uh, how many people in here have ever had that situation occur for them? Right? OK, literally everybody in the room. Now, let me ask you this. Do you fall asleep? Almost never, right? Your brain just starts going and going and going and going. That's a situation where your adenosine is very, very high, but your circadian rhythm is off because you went to bed too early. One of the number one things that my insomnia patients do is go to bed too early, which sounds completely counterintuitive, right? Like if I've got insomnia and I'm tired, maybe I can get in bed and catch up on my sleep. It doesn't really work that way. 
Same holds true for the, the drive situation. So how many people in here have had a nice big dinner and they sat down on the couch just because they were watching a little TV and before they knew it, they were out for about an hour. Took an unscheduled nap, right? Then when you go back and go to bed at your normal bedtime, what happens? You can't sleep because you've actually reduced sleep drive at that time. Your circadian rhythm is ready to sleep, but your drive is down because you got rid of some of that adenosine during your nap. So we've all had both of these systems kind of go a little kooky for us. And so the goal here is to be able to get people to understand the drive, understand the rhythm. And when those two are in balance, that's when we sleep. So it turns out that all of our hormones lead a circadian life. So what is circadian? It's a 24-hour cycle. But yet every hormone in our body is very, very predictable. So if you look here on the slides, you can see, for example, cortisol follows a very predictable schedule. So does adrenaline, and so does melatonin. Kind of interesting, melatonin is almost the exact opposite of cortisol, but it actually corresponds very well with core body temperature. So as core body temperature lowers, we see melatonin rising. These are very, very predictable situations in the body. So why is that important, and how can we use that to leverage it for ourselves? Well, have any, anybody in here ever been called an early bird before? Like to get up really early, 5.30, 6 o'clock? OK. How about night owls? I'm actually the night owl side of things. So interesting, yeah, I know you are too. So it's interesting when you start to think about that idea. So when you think about an early bird or a night owl, if we actually looked at their melatonin, it actually falls under the same uh, waveform, however, at different times. So if we look here and we see the red, that's an early bird, and the blue, that's a night owl, it turns out that even though they have the same melatonin curve, they're, they're happening at very different times in their own 24-hour cycle, which is very, very interesting when you start to think about it. So Michael, you're telling me that if I'm a night owl and um, I wake up at 7 o'clock, 6.30 in the morning, what's going on? My melatonin faucet is still running running, running, whereas if I'm an early bird, it's not. So this is why, for all of you people who are night owls, raise your hand again if you're a night owl. Right? This is why mornings suck, OK? Bottom line, there's nothing fun about getting up in the mornings for you people because of this. Your melatonin is actually still going. It's still moving in that direction. And that's where that morning fog is coming from. Whereas for all of you early birds, mornings are a breeze for you. However, doing stuff late at night doesn't always work out so well. So what I did was I created a quiz for people to be able to tell. Because by the way, there aren't just two of these what we call chronotypes. So first of all, has everybody in here gotten an opportunity to take the quiz? No? OK, so if you haven't, or you have, OK. So if you haven't had a chance to take the quiz, go to thepowerofwhenquiz.com. Um, and it's available right now. You go on there, and, you, and it takes like literally two minutes to do it, and then you'll be able to learn what your chronotype is. And I'm going to go through all of the different chronotypes right now. But the quiz is a little weird because it doesn't, take into, it doesn't ask you some of the questions that you might imagine. So it takes into account things like personality. For example, there are certain chronotypes that are more introverted and certain chronotypes that are more extroverted. It takes into account things like sleep timing and preference, which would make sense, right? That would be kind of one of the things that we should look at. And then it takes into account sleep drive. So it turns out that all of this is genetically predetermined based on something called your PER3 gene. Believe it or not, there are over 80 different markers for sleep um, in the genetics uh, of the, the, if you looked at the whole microbiome and you looked at all of that area, you'd actually find that there are actually 84, I think it is, genetic markers out there um, looking at the human genome. But the PER3 gene is the one that's the most really in there for what we're talking about here. And it has a lot to do with sleep drive. So when you're taking the quiz, that's what the questions are going to be about. And it'll give you what's called a personalized chrono category, or what I call a chronotype. So it turns out that there's four, not two. Um, and if you look historically, we've always known about the two. Actually, there have been quizzes and assessment tools around for quite a while looking at the early bird and the night owl. But not necessarily people in the middle, and also not necessarily people with insomnia. So it turns out that people with insomnia actually have a very different um, genetic makeup in certain cases. And uh, a lot of it is actually genetically predetermined. So it's important for you to be able to understand and recognize that you might fall into one of those categories as well. So what I thought I would do is go through each of the chronotypes while people out there are taking the quiz uh, and learning what their chronotype is. That way they can get an understanding of some of the things that are going on with them. 
So first one are what I call lions. So I replaced the vernacular of birds to mammals. So first of all, why did I do that? Well, because I'm a mammal, I'm not a bird, and I really thought it would make more sense to look at different mammals. And by the way, these animals all actually have the chronotype that we're talking about. So lions have a tendency to, their first kill is at dawn. They wake up very, very early, and that's where they do most of their hunting. Uh, but my lions as a group, not as the animal, but now as all of us would be, are pretty interesting folks. They make up about 15%, 15 to 20% of the population. And um, these are my early morning optimists with uh, what we would consider to be a medium sleep drive. Uh, these are my go-getters. These are my COOs. These are the managers. These are people who are really good at asking people to do certain things and trying to move people through a process. Um, they're likely to help, uh, prioritize health and fitness. Uh, these are people who like to do the marathons, who like to you know, do the triathlons. These are your crossfitters, your tough mutters, people like that. Um, but they also have a very interesting tendency. They like to make a plan almost every day, and they like to stick to it. So they like to do the first thing, and then the second thing, and then the third thing, and then the fourth thing. They do not like to derivate whatsoever. So how many people in here, by the way, are a lion or an early bird? So does any of that kind of ring true for you guys? Is that sort of something that sort of makes sense to you, that you have a tendency to get up very early in the morning, follow that plan, um, be able to kind of be more on the leadership side? Is that something that people find a, that resonates with them? Also, we know that these people have a tendency to go to bed really early. Um, so these are my 8.30, 9 o'clockers, because they're getting up at 5.30 in the morning. So it's not an uncommon situation for these people. Now, I've had a lot of people who are lions turn to me and they say, I feel so guilty because I can never make it through dinner and a movie, right? Dinner is fine, but the movie, forget about it. I'm out cold. I had one person tell me at my uh, most recent lecture that they actually go to the movie early. So they do like a five o'clock movie and then they go to dinner afterwards because it's the only way that they can actually see any of the cinema that they want to see because otherwise they're out cold every single time. So let's talk about bears. So bears make up about 50, 55% of the population. So one in two people is a bear. Now before I talk about bears, remember you can actually lean more towards a lion yet still be a bear or lean more towards what I call a wolf and still be a bear because there are hybrids that are out there. But um, these are my people who actually have a very healthy sleep drive and they're what I call solar sleepers. So these people have a tendency to um, follow our, our main schedule. By the way, being a bear is the best chronotype to be. Um, most people actually tell me that they would rather be a lion and they have what I call lion envy. Um, I'm, not, I'm not sure if that's really the best way to be. The world really operates on a bear's schedule. Right? And so that's why we have nine to five work schedules. Um, this is why carpools and buses go in the certain schedules. This is why every, literally everything that we do kind of runs in this sort of what we call a solar schedule. So it's much easier for bears in general. Um, uh, they get the work done in society. They have a tendency to really be able to accomplish a whole lot, uh, as well as they have a tendency to be extroverted and very open-minded. So these are the people that it's great to hang out with and have lunch because they've always got the funny story to tell. They kind of know the gossip that's going on in the office or something like that. They've probably been the ones who are watching The Bachelor and talking about it with you incessantly, um, that kind of thing. But they're a lot of fun, really interesting uh, people. And again, they make up a large bulk of society. Uh, and um, I, yeah, I said most of society is built around their schedule. So wolves, how many people are late night people like me? Okay, so I'm, I'm a wolf. I don't go to bed ever before midnight. Uh, it's very, very rare. Um, I, if it was up to me, I would sleep until 7.30, 8 o'clock each day, if that were even possible. And I certainly wouldn't go to bed at midnight then. I'd go to bed at 2, because I'm, I'm that kind of a night person. Uh, and it's very interesting when you start to think about it, because the world was not built for night people, unless, of course, you're a shift worker. Um, but uh, all of us get the tag of being lazy. We get the tag of you're not a morning person. And people seem to schedule meetings for us at ungodly hours of the morning, and it never seems to work out. Um, but we happen to be very creative thinkers. So uh, wolves are actually my introverts. They're, they're very interesting. These are the most creative people that I have. Um, they crave novelty and risks. Um, and if they do bother to make a plan, they never stick to it. Um, they'll do the first thing on the list, and then the sixth thing on the list, and then the fourth thing on the list. And so they get distracted very, very easily, yet they still get a lot of things done. Um, I would say these are my authors, my actors, my musicians, people like that. Uh, they become deeply loyal friends, too. Um, these are the people that will happily stay up all night with you and talk with you because 
they can. <laughs> it doesn't bother them to stay up all night. Um, and they're, they're really great people. Dolphins are my problem children. So was anybody in here take the quiz? Did, did, were, they, did they, were they a dolphin? Did they want to raise their hand and admit? OK. So my dolphins are my people who don't sleep very well. They have difficulty either falling asleep or staying asleep most of the time. Not every dolphin is like this, but I do have that happen. Uh, these are highly, highly intelligent people. Um, and, um, but they have very erratic sleep schedules, like I said. And uh, sometimes they've already tried multiple things to help them with their sleep. And so a lot of this, uh, this vernacular comes from my work uh, as a sleep specialist. So I'm an actively practicing sleep doctor. I've been practicing for 17 years. And my specialty is insomnia. And one of the things that was interesting is I had a patient come to me and she said, you know, I'm a terrible sleeper. So I started walking down the road of cognitive behavioral therapy with her. And we tried just about everything and nothing worked. And, and it was a complete and total failure, which is kind of rare when you start to understand more about the reasoning behind what goes on with people who have sleep problems. And uh, so I brought her in and I said, you know, let's try to figure out what's going on. And she said, well, it's not that I can't fall asleep and it's not that I can't stay asleep. She said, it's that I sleep at the wrong time. And so then I started thinking about my kids. So my daughter is here with me today. My son and her have the exact same sleep pattern. If it was up to them, they would go to bed at 2, and they would sleep until 12. And this is what happens in our house on the weekends. Anybody in here have teenagers? So yeah, you know exactly what I'm talking about. It's, it's incredible. Um, and so they're wolves. And so I started to think about this patient. I discovered, you know what, she's actually a wolf. And so what I did was I asked her boss, can we change her work schedule? And he was like, well, you better do something quick because in about a week, I'm going to fire her. I was like, no pressure. Great. Fantastic. <laughs> so I go in and I said, all right, let's, let's go with this. And we changed her work times so that she came in at around 1030, but she would work until about 637 o'clock. Right? So just a shift in her work schedule. And after a week, I called the boss back and I said, hey, how'd it go? He said, I don't know what you did, but this is fantastic. He said, her work product is better. She doesn't fall asleep in meetings. It's, it's like a miracle. So I'm like, oh. I said, are you going to fire her? He's like, no, 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 we're not going to fire her. Oh, great. So I call the, um, the husband. Well, I actually call her to tell her the good news. And the husband picks up the phone. And he said something to me that I'll never forget. He said, I like my wife better, which I thought was a really strong statement to make, <laughs> number one, to somebody he had never talked to before. But what he was telling me was is he now understood a lot more about her as a person. And so the power of when has a lot to do with when somebody is on and when somebody is off and how all of these hormones work together in order for people to understand these things. It's really a, a communication tool more than anything. And what I find is as soon as one person takes the quiz, they have everybody in their family take the quiz and start learning more about how can I communicate better within my family. Um, so again, highly intelligent. Uh, my dolphins are super intelligent people. They do have a tendency to be a little obsessive compulsive. Um, and sometimes that gets in the way of their levels of productivity because they want it to be perfect at every juncture. And that was a little bit like um, this woman. So, but it turned out that she wasn't a dolphin. It turned out that she was a wolf. And once we were able to change her schedule, it actually worked out quite well. Um, so who cares about all of this stuff? Remember, if you know what your chronotype is, and then you know what your hormones are going to be doing throughout a particular day, I can actually match the times of day when your hormones are at, at a particular level where it would be optimal to do that activity. Right? It's actually a matching game. It's super simple. So this sounds too good to be true, right? How could he possibly be able to do something like this? Well, so I've actually got over 350 studies backing me up on this. Now, I didn't do 350 studies. What I did was I aggregated data up from around the world. And it turns out that this is an area called chronobiology. And it's been studied for 15, almost 20 years now. And so we've got a tremendous amount of data at our, at our fingertips to be able to see, hey, what can we do? What can we do better? And at what time would it be better to do it? So, what I thought I would do is I'd take a couple of topics for you and show you how that works. Now, in the book, The Power of When, um, there's 50 different topics. So what I did was I went through my day of every single thing that I did during the day, and I wrote it down. Then I asked my wife to do the same. Then I asked a couple of friends to do the same. We came up with roughly 50 different activities. But I thought I would do some on health and then some on, in business so that you could get an idea of sort of what's been going on. So I start off with these topics, and you'll find them actually quite interesting. So first, let's talk about caffeine. 
So, you know, I've, I've been walking around Google's campus, and one of the things that I noticed is you're never more than probably like 50 to 100 feet away from a source of caffeine, right? That seems to be a theme here. Um, and there's a lot of coffee being drunk here, right? So I get it. Caffeine is the most abused substance in the world, um, and it's the most used substance in the world, which is kind of interesting. But did you know that there are actually times where you can drink your caffeine and it will actually give you more energy? That's probably pretty interesting to you. So it all, it's all based on a couple of different things. One is what's called your cortisol rhythm. So cortisol is the fight or flight hormone, right? That's the thing that if you're in trouble, it kicks in gear and helps you, you know, get out of there. Well, it's also the hormone that helps pull your body out of a state of unconsciousness. So when you wake up in the morning, your cortisol levels are actually quite high. When you go to sleep at night, you want your cortisol levels to be quite low. All right, so thinking about that for a second, if our cortisol level is high and we look at, the, at the, how powerful cortisol is versus caffeine, what we now discover is that cortisol is like cocaine and caffeine is like weak tea, okay? So it really does almost no good to add caffeine on top of an already elevated system that's full of cortisol. However, if you wait approximately 90 to 120 minutes after you wake up, your natural cortisol level begins to dip. And that's when, if you have caffeine, it actually helps elevate that cortisol level back up and give you that level of energy. Previously, so by a raise of hands, how many people in here have coffee in the morning as the first thing that they drink? So that's bad. <laughs> okay, let me tell you why. When you're uh, asleep at night, in your breath, you actually breathe out almost a full liter of water every night. And so you wake up dehydrated. Caffeine's a diuretic. So when you drink coffee, all you're doing is actually not adding fluid to the system. You're actually making it worse, and your system wants to actually get rid of even more water. The very first thing that you should be doing is drinking a 12 to 16 ounce bottle of water. If you can, make it uh, not cold, but lukewarm, something that was probably by your bedside at night. But you want to rehydrate the system, number one. Um, caffeine doesn't help you with that, but waiting 90 to 120 minutes later, it actually works out pretty well. The second thing has to do with your metabolic rhythm. So it, Caffeine has a half-life of between six and eight hours. And so when you're talking about something like that, you want to stop caffeine by about 2.30, 3 o'clock. Otherwise, it can have an effect on your ability to fall asleep or get into deeper stages of sleep. So I'm sure that there are plenty of people in here who will tell me, Michael, I could have a cup of coffee at 10 o'clock at night, right? I've got a couple of people in the front row here that are smiling, and I could fall right asleep, no problem. That's true, but that probably means that you're sleep deprived, um, incredibly sleep deprived, depending upon the level of caffeine that you could be bringing in. So one of the things I could say to you is if I put uh, something on your brain to monitor your brain waves as you're falling asleep, what I could probably show you is because you've got so much caffeine on board, you're actually not getting into the deeper stages of sleep. And that's where it can get pro become very problematic. So the worst thing in the world you can do is drink coffee in the morning. So for my chronotypes, this actually works out really well. So this is our first test, is trying to figure out when should each of these people have caffeine. So dolphins will probably want to have it, and I had a couple of dolphins here in the audience, probably at 8.30 to 10, and then you can have it again between 1 and 2. Lions are going to be a little bit earlier, because remember, lions have a tendency to wake up early in the morning. Bears, a little bit later. And then wolves, really, and this is a problem for us wolves, is because we're so tired in the mornings and society makes us get up earlier, we're just pounding coffee constantly. And what you'll find is, is that all you're really getting is side effects from it. You're really not getting the energy boost that you're looking for. So I ask wolves to actually have caffeine much later in the day, but not too late, because that's really when your energy systems are going to be kicking in, and then you really actually don't need it as much. So I'm going to give everybody a bonus hack, um, and I call this the Napa Latte. All right, so let's say that you only got four and a half to five hours of sleep the, uh, the other night, and you got a big presentation to give. You got something else that's going on, and, and, and you, you've really got to be on your mark. So here's what I want you to do, is take a six ounce cup of drip coffee, which has the highest caffeine content, about 100, 110 milligrams. Put in three ice cubes to cool it down, okay? Slug the whole thing really quick, and then take a 25 minute nap. All right? You'll reduce the amount of adenosine in your system so that you're not as sleepy. The caffeine locks into those receptor sites. You're good for four hours, guaranteed. I do this about three times a week. So <laughs> Joe here has commented that he does this about three times a week. And it really works. 
it's really pretty impressive. I use this with all my Fortune 100 CEOs. I use it for whole executive teams. Three times a week is about the maximum that you want to use it. You don't want to be using it every day, Joe. Um, but it's true, it, and it works really, really well, especially on those days where you really haven't gotten the quality sleep that you were looking for. Um, also, it turns out broccoli is one of the things that will actually help pull caffeine out of your system. I've seen two studies to show this. I don't know exactly what the mechanism of action is there, but it turns out that if you've got too much caffeine in your system, steamed broccoli with dinner can actually help pull some of that caffeine out of your system rather quickly. So is there a right time to go running? How many people in here are runners? I know Nick's a runner. OK, so we've got quite a few people in here are runners. So this is very interesting. There are different rhythms in the body that tell us when is a good time to run. So it depends on what you want to accomplish with your run. So if you want to burn fat, you actually want to run more in the morning on an empty stomach. Not a dehydrated stomach, but an empty stomach, because your body's got to get the fuel from someplace, and so it's going to pull it from fat. Um, but what if, you're on, what if you're a performance-based runner? Like what if you're training for a marathon, or a CrossFit, or you're doing a triathlon or something like that? It turns out that there are better times of day for performance than you might expect. And these are actually based on chronotypes. So lions are actually best in the late morning, which would make sense because they're early morning people. Bears in the afternoon, wolves are best in the evenings. And dolphins are actually good in the morning because dolphins use exercise to help relax them. Right, and help kind of give them a, that, take that level of anxiety and, and lower it down. Although one thing I have noticed about my bears in general is if bears don't exercise in the morning, they just won't do it. Um, it's, it's, it's pretty interesting. Um, they, they might do better in the later afternoon, but I promise you um, that nine times out of 10, they're, they're not going to do it if they don't exercise in the morning. So I'd rather you exercise in the morning. Um, so maybe as a bear, you might burn a little bit more fat than you might from a performance standpoint. But what about training for strength? So we talked about cardio, but what about strength training? So strength training is very interesting. So when you look at um, the muscle growth rhythms that are out there, it doesn't really matter when you train if you want your muscles to get bigger. But if you want them to actually get stronger, there actually is a rhythm based on, God bless you. Actually, God bless all of us. Um, based on, <laughs> that got the biggest laugh so far. All right, good to know. So. Um, he timed that just perfectly for me. So when you look at muscle strength, it turns out that there are t it's a testosterone ratio. And so when we have more testosterone, we actually can have better strength. And so looking at lions, bears, and dolphins, and wolves, we actually know what their testosterone rhythms are. And that's part of the reason why they can actually lift more weights and actually be stronger by doing their exercise at different times. So we've talked about caffeine. We've talked about exercise. It is St. Patrick's Day. I guess we have to talk about green beer. So let's talk about alcohol for a second. So it turns out that your liver produces this thing called alcohol dehydrogenase. And what it does is it actually helps filter through and, and get that alcohol out of your system. Guess what? It doesn't really happen very much in the mornings. So if you're having brunch and having mimosas and Bloody Marys, you really need about half the amount of alcohol in the morning that you would normally to get the same effect in the afternoon or evening. So that's kind of interesting in terms of your tolerance rhythm will change. You are le much less tolerant. Alcohol has much bigger effect on you in the mornings than it ever will in the afternoons or evenings. But then there's this thing called happy hour. Right? And so what is happy hour? Happy hour is really interesting because when you look at it from a biochemical standpoint, uh, this alcohol dehydrogenase really kicks into gear about 4.35 o'clock. And it goes really hard until about 7. So a lot of the alcohol establishments over the last 100 years or so have figured out this. And they know that you'll actually be drinking more during this period of time. And that's why they give you free food or reduced cost food to drive you in to then drink more, because your body can actually handle drinking more um, at that point. Now, what ends up happening is you know, sometimes you may drink in a little bit of excess, and then you end up with the hangover. right? So there's something called the hangover rhythm. right? And so this is actually, again, when is your body able to pull the alcohol in or out? And when you take all these rhythms into account, there's a couple things that you can learn. So this is what I call strategic <laughs> drinking. So if you go by your chronotype, here's what you will learn, um, is that dolphins are actually good between 6 and 8, lions, uh, again, a little bit earlier, bears, kind of in the middle, and then wolves, we can party all night long. Um, and so it's kind of interesting when you start to think through the idea of chemically or biochemically speaking, what's going on in your body, how could that possibly have an effect um, on whatever it is that you're ingesting, whether it's caffeine, alcohol, you name it. 
Um, and then I also brought in a couple of hangover hacks for people who are wolves who had a tendency to drink late at night. Um, a couple of things to think about. One glass of water for every alcoholic beverage. Number one, it slows down the sheer volume of alcohol you're putting in your system. But remember, alcohol is a diuretic. And sort of once you break the seal and you go to the bathroom once, you're done. You're just going to go to the bathroom, go to the bathroom, go to the bathroom. And so you really need to rehydrate as best you can. Um, I've seen two studies to show that coconut water before bed seems to help. I have no data other than these, these kind of, uh, and they were anecdotal case studies. They weren't really anything really good. So give it a shot if you want. Um, if you can, stop drinking about three hours before bed. Um, it takes the average human body approximately one hour per alcoholic beverage to digest through it. And so if you had two or three beers, at, uh, wine with dinner, then if you stop at like, let's say eight, and then you would go to bed at 11, then it would be out of your system. Remember, there's a really big difference between going to sleep and passing out. Okay, and so we want to be careful about the passing out phase. Uh, also, it turns out that alcohol really pulls out of your body magnesium and vitamin B. So taking those in the morning can actually be very, very helpful. And then just time. Um, you know, it, the whole idea of hair of the dog that bit you is never a good idea. Um, so don't start drinking early in the morning because remember, your tolerance uh, rhythm is going to have a pretty big effect there. Uh, when should you go to bed? This is a question that I get asked all the time because I'm the sleep doctor. So of course, that's the question that people are going to ask me. So it's really interesting, but most people don't know their bedtime. They have a socially determined wake up time, but they don't actually know what time they need to go to bed. Um, you know, like when was the last time somebody told you to go to bed when you were like 10, 12 years old? So what I know is that most people have this socially determined wake up time. It tends to be around 6.30. So in our house, we wake up at 6.30 because the kids are getting ready for school. Um, and so. I know it's 6.30, and so we know that the average sleep cycle is approximately 90 minutes long. We know the average person has five of these sleep cycles. So five times 90 is, come on, guys, 450. Nobody said there'd be math, right? OK, 450. So if we take 450 minutes, and we divide it by 60 minutes an hour, we get seven and a half hours. So if you do the math, it gets kind of interesting. We, if we take with our lions and our bears, we take 90 minute sleep cycle, five sleep cycles, and roughly 20 minutes to fall asleep, they have roughly 470 minutes to count backwards from their wake up time, right? And then they know what time to go to bed. Another interesting fact, wolves and dolphins don't get five cycles, they have a tendency to get four cycles, and it takes us longer to fall asleep. So the total minutes for a wolf or a dolphin might be closer to 400, where the total minutes for a bear or a lion might be closer to 470. Eight hours is a myth, OK? Eight hours is a myth. Very few people need exactly eight hours of sleep. I personally am a six and a half hour sleeper. I have been almost my entire life. I go to bed around midnight. I wake up around 630, because I'm a wolf, right? There's nothing wrong with sleeping only six and a half hours if you wake up and you feel energized and you feel good. If you wake up and you feel bad, then guess what? You might need more time. So try running this experiment at home for a week. Take your socially determined wake up time, and if you're a dolphin or a wolf, count back 400 minutes. If you're a lion or a bear, count back 470 minutes. And if you're waking up within five minutes of your alarm, then guess what? You figured out how much sleep you need. Some people, their sleep cycle isn't 90 minutes. My sleep cycle is actually 80 minutes. So that's why it works that way. Now, I've got the you know, good fortune of being able to test it out in sleep labs. And I keep something by my bedside that measures my sleep every night called uh, an S plus. And so I actually know exactly what my sleep is all the time. And if you're interested in that, we can certainly get you the information about that as well. But try out this experiment. You might be very, very surprised at what you learn. So what's the good bedtime? So I actually plotted it out for everybody. Um, but it's in the book. And again, you can figure it out based on your um, chronotype as well as your sleep score. So I have wake up times and bedtimes various throughout the evening so that people can figure this out. So what about sex? So this is a question I get asked every single time I do something is, well, is there a right time for sex? Is there a wrong time for sex? So my daughter's in the room. So I'm going to ask her to put her hands over her ears so that she can't hear anything. Thank you, Carson. I appreciate you doing that. Um, 13-year-old daughter in the audience, what are you going to do? So what, is there a best time for sex? So it turns out that there are actually, you don't really have to keep your hands over your ears. Um, <laughs> it turns out that there are 72% of people have sex between 10.30 and 11.30 at night. Okay. Now that, that makes sense, right? You're in with your partner. You're not wearing ne nearly as many clothes. You kind of look like, hey, you interested? Yeah, sure, why not? Okay, right? And there, and there you go, right? 
kind of interesting when you look at your hormone distribution at that particular time of day, right? So this is actually when your hormone profile is worst to have sex. You have low levels of testosterone, you have low levels of estrogen, low levels of progesterone, low cortisol, and high melatonin. I can't think of any worse particular time to try to have a sexual activity when all of those hormones are working against you, not in the right direction, right? So what am I gonna do? First of all, we, did this, we looked at this and it turns out that lions actually have their strongest desire in the early morning hours, not a big surprise there. Dolphins reported a very calming effect from having sex in the morning. And wolves just stayed up later and ended up having sex because again, that's what their kind of whole chronotype wants to do. And men prefer sex at any time it's offered. <laughs> um, this is not a joke, this was true. So it turns out that men would, if it was offered, it didn't really matter what their chronotype was, they were ready to go. So what happens if you are one chronotype and your bed partner is a different chronotype, right? So I created a matrix <laughs> in great algorithmic Google fashion uh, to be able to tell people, and I have an early evening time and an early morning time. So you heard it here from the sleep doctor in the power of when. Everybody should try having sex Saturday morning at around eight or nine o'clock in the morning just to see if it's any better than at night. And you might actually be very, very surprised. Uh, there's a whole chapter on this in the book, and I actually also have a separate matrix for uh, heterosexual couples, then for uh, lesbian couples, and for gay couples, because the hormone distributions are very, very different. So check it out. I think you'll find it quite fascinating. So now we're going to move on to productivity. So speaking of sex, we'll talk about productivity. Um, so what are we going to talk about here? There's a lot of really interesting things that are going on now. I'm actually being asked by companies to come in and chronotype the entire company. Because one of the things that they're finding is they say, well, I've got a preponderance of wolves in my creative department, which makes sense, right? Because that's what wolves are. They're my internal, you know, introverted, more creative people. And some idiot is having a meeting for them at 9 o'clock or 8 o'clock in the morning. Well, none of them are even awake. They can't even think at that period of time. So chronotyping the company and then working with the scheduling department and then looking at the content of those meetings turns out to be incredibly interesting for levels of productivity. And we're starting to find now that people are getting more and more productive simply by using these types of tools at their disposal. So let's talk about brainstorming, right? And so I know that there's time spent here for people where you have a certain amount of time each day to think about something different or a different kind of project or something like that. Well, if you're kind of trying to come up with ideas, sometimes that's not always so easy. How many people in here feel like they've had their best idea when they were in the shower, on the treadmill, going for a run, something like that? Right? So there's a reason for that, okay? And it's called, well, I'm going to tell you all these different rhythms. That one in particular is called the distraction rhythm. So have you ever noticed how when you're doing one thing and then all of a sudden a new thought comes flying into your head? So if your body is distracted with a physical activity, whether it's a shower or going for a run, you actually have a greater likelihood of these ideas being able to come to you. The connectivity rhythm is very interesting. So there's only certain times of day where your right side of your brain likes to talk to the left side of your brain and there's a lot of more interaction. It happens to be earlier in the morning. The novelty rhythm is something else as well. So you ever get into a new situation, meet a new person, and all of a sudden you got so much in common with them and they think like you and you think like them and all of a sudden you start tossing ideas back and forth and before you know it, you're really connected with them. That's actually how I met Joe, right? We started, we met, we started talking. And I was like, oh my gosh, you like sleep, I like sleep, uh, and we started talking about it and then all of a sudden here I am at Google talking about sleep. <laughs> Right? So, you know, and what happens is, is it spurs on new ideas. So having those new experiences can be very, very important. And then there's something called the REM rhythm. So most people don't know this, but you move information from your short-term memory to your long-term memory during REM sleep. That becomes critically important because you create an organizational substructure in your brain to deposit information. And then you have connections between these pieces of information to retrieve them to solve problems. So most of your problem solving can really occur while you're unconscious. So first of all, if you've ever heard the old adage of sleep on it before you make a big decision, it's true. All right? In our house, we never make a major decision without sleeping on it. Because there's so much information that's got to be compiled and kind of micro-processed within my head, it's really hard to do that. So being able to give yourself that time becomes very, very important. So I call these moments of groggy greatness. Okay, and so the worst time to try to brainstorm is between 11 and three, 
right? Because that's where you've had lunch, you're, uh, you actually have a small spike in core body temperature, which releases a little bit of melatonin, so it's not necessarily always great. Although for some of my bears, um, that can actually be a decent time as well. But it just depends, sometimes they have something else going on. But my dolphins, and you notice how early these times are, right? So for my lions, 4 a.m. to 6 a.m. Well, hopefully you're not awake at 4 a.m. That's kind of where the REM is coming in, but right after you wake up. One of the best ways to do something is take a topic and put it on a piece of paper and a pen and then put it by your bedside. Okay, and when you wake up in the morning, the first thing you do is look at that topic and write down everything you can think about about that topic. Within five to seven days, I guarantee you, you will come up with an idea that you've never had before. Again, it's because of this microprocessing that gets to go on in your head. And that's not the only time. The second time happens to be in the, in the afternoon. Now, if you notice here, dolphins between 2 and 4, and I'm talking over here, that you shouldn't go uh, between 11 and 3. Dolphins are different because of their level of anxiety is much higher. And so they can actually funnel in and get to that moment a little bit earlier when most of us can't. But again, what I did was I lined up the times. And so you actually have two times of day where brainstorming is going to be better than any other time during the day. Now, how many people in here by a raise of hands have ever noticed that there are certain times of day that they do things better than others, right? So this is what I'm talking about here, is if you're trying to force a brainstorm, it doesn't always work. But if you know what times you're able to naturally get there, give yourself a shot. You might be surprised at what happens. Um, the same holds true for being on in terms of being able to be alert and focused. So, I'm sure a lot of you have to present ideas to people and be able to talk to people and tell people all the kinds of things that you're working on and things like that. Well, it turns out that there are certain chronotypes that do this better than others. Lions, they love to be in front of a room, right? Not a big surprise, right? They're my COOs, my kind of leaders of the pack. Not a, not a big shocker there. Dolphins, not as much. They can do it, but they would much rather be in the back and kind of be able to do their own thing. Wolves would actually prefer to go to happy hour as opposed to give a major presentation, which is what I would prefer to do most of the time. And bears are actually happy to be in the audience and be learn from the presentation, not necessarily have to give that presentation. But there are actually rhythms for attending a presentation. So let's say you want to schedule a time. So actually, the most flexible time is between 2.30 and 3 in the afternoon. Um, the second best time is between 10 and 11. So not when somebody just gets there, but after they've had a chance to kind of settle in. The least flexible time, as you can see, 9.15. Worst time, second worst time is 12 to 1. So these are data that come from a, there was a, a software program called Meet With Me. And they, did, they uh, had over half a million meetings. And then you had to click that you were attending the meeting or not attending the meeting. And so these data actually are full on, straight up objective. Turns out Tuesday afternoons have the highest flexibility for meetings, and Monday mornings have the lowest flexibility. Not really a big surprise, right? Who wants to have an 8 a.m. Monday morning meeting, right? Nobody. Nobody wants to do that. And also, it's really hard to start your week off having that kind of meeting and things like that. Now, aside from assigning when the presentation should be, how about giving the presentation? So you want to have your energy rhythm. So when are you at your peak? Right? When are you going to be most articulate? When are you going to be able to focus the most and give the most information? And then engagement. When is your audience going to have an interest in what you're having to say? So I actually created, again, another matrix based on chronotypes. And what you'll find is that different people are on at different times. This is why when I chronotype a company, it gets really interesting really quickly. Because we've got the presenter, and then we've got the audience. And making that match appropriately turns out to be a really interesting way to increase levels of productivity. Um, a couple of things about audience engagement that you may know or may not know. Roughly 30 minutes after you start, one in seven people will be zoned out. I can see people already starting to get there. Um, after 45 minutes, one in three will basically become a zombie. And then um, you do have something that's called cognitive backlog that occurs, right? So right now, I've given you, you're like drinking from the fire hose. I've given you so much information. Don't expect to remember it all. Check out the book. The, don't forget that this is all being live streamed and it's going to be up on YouTube for people to watch. So you know, don't try to take it all in. But you can't get that much information in your brain at any one given time. Best and worst times to present. This is, again, based on energy level for my, my different chronotypes and worst times for everybody in general. So even if you don't know everybody in your audience, these are the times that you want to avoid if you possibly can. So what about making a decision? 
Okay, so it, it turns out that there are on-peak times where you're logical and very low risk in your decision making, and off-peak times where you're far more emotional and high risk decision making. Um, these are actually influenced by sleep deprivation, your personality, and what we call the procrastination rhythm. Right? So everybody in here is probably familiar with the procrastination rhythm. It turns out that this is actually by chronotype. And so some uh, of my chronotypes are world champion procrastinators. Um, those would be the wolves or the late night people like myself. Um, the people who are not big on procrastination turns out to be the lions um, and the early morning people. It's kind of interesting. So when is the best time for you to make a decision? So these are the times during the day that you're actually going to make the most clear-headed, logical decision based on your endocrine system, based on when your hormones are hitting the different highs and lows throughout the day. Uh, which is, again, is pretty interesting when you start to think about it. Could I reschedule, could I rejigger my schedule one way or another to be able to allow me to make better decisions, to be able to be more productive, things like that. So can you hack your chronotype? So the answer is yes, you can. I'm not sure you want to, but you can. Um, so the strategic use of light, caffeine, and melatonin can do this. Because here's the thing to remember, is if you're a wolf and you're living in a bear's world, all you are is jet lagged. Right? And these are the components that we use to help people with jet lag. So if you want to, you can actually utilize light therapy. I know we had Fred Maxick talking earlier this week about how to use light. Um, and you can have melatonin in the evenings, caffeine and light in the mornings. And you can actually shift yourself. You can actually make yourself into something that you weren't genetically predisposed to be. I don't recommend it. Um, but it is something that, unfortunately, some of us have to do it whether we like it or not. Right? And so thinking through these ideas, you don't necessarily want to go against your genetics if you can possibly help it. Um, how do you make yourself a morning person? This is the second biggest question I get after sex, um, is how do I change myself to become that morning person? So here's a couple of ideas that you could try if you'd like at home. So first of all, going to bed at the right time for you every night. Again, it's in the book, but it's also based on your chronotype. Number two, never hit the snooze button. So by a raise of hands, how many people in here hit the snooze button at least once? Come on, don't lie. OK, keep your hands raised. Keep your hands raised twice, three times, four times. All right, so we've ended at three. I was giving this lecture, and I had somebody at seven times for a snooze button, OK? So let me tell you why the snooze button is the single worst invention in all of sleep. So it turns out that the average snooze is between seven and nine minutes long, and your body physically can't get into a deep stage of sleep at that point. And we know that REM sleep, remember from the creativity stuff and the brainstorming stuff, is all, the bulk of it happens in the last part of the night. So what you do by hitting the snooze is you actually knock down your levels of creativity and brainstorming. I'd much rather you just set your alarm for the last possible moment that you have to wake up, because you'll get a lot more better quality sleep. Um, get direct sunlight for 10 minutes in the morning. So once you've reached over and you've grabbed your bottle of water because you're dehydrated, I want you to walk to the window and get some sunlight. Do me a favor, put on a robe, okay? Lots, I have to tell this to people lots of time, they don't think about it and then the neighbors get a big scare. Um, <laughs> remember to drink your water um, and let there be light and music. So it's very, very interesting. How many people listen to music in the mornings when they're getting ready? So that's a great thing that you do. And it works really, really well. And you should use high energy, high emotion music. So music that you love to dance to, that really gets you going, is fantastic. Because then you're using a secondary sense. You're not just having light, but you're also having sound to help wake your brain up in the morning. So one of the things that I, so in our house, my son listens to music almost every single morning. My daughter doesn't necessarily like it. And when it's too early in the morning, um, because she can sleep in a little bit longer than he can. And so the rule in our house is at 6.30 is when you can actually fire up the, the music. And I walk in there, and he's singing, he's dancing around, and he's 15 years old, OK? To get a 15-year-old to get up at 6.30 in the morning and be any level of consciousness is almost an impossibility. So by having that light that's coming in and then also having the music, it really has a tendency to help you out. Um, exercising your body and mind is always going to be good. Even if you can only do 10 push-ups or 15 push-ups in the morning, do something to get your heart rate up. If it's dancing around, don't dance in the shower. Dance outside of the shower. We don't want anybody slipping and falling. But at the end of the day, doing something to get that level of energy up is good. If it's Saturday morning, that's the perfect time for sex. So go ahead and try that. You never know. It might help wake you up and make you a morning person. Um, the other thing I talk about is a cool, not cold shower. 
So this is something that I do every morning, uh, or most mornings, and it's a meditation technique that I do. And I teach it to people all the time. So you, you stand in front where the, the shower head is right at your head, and you have it hit you literally square between the eyes. There's like a waterfall of water that comes down, and it covers your nose, so it's actually difficult to breathe. So you have to open up your mouth, and you have to concentrate really hard on how you breathe. And if you sit there for about a minute, you can't think of anything other than your breathing. Okay, and so it really focuses you in and you really come out of this really in the moment. While you're doing that, take the, um, the nozzle and turn it to get a little cooler, a little cooler, a little cooler. Don't make it cold, just get it cooler. What happens is the blood shunts into your, um, into your trunk and it actually causes your heart rate to go up and it actually helps wake you up even more. So by using this meditation, and then when you turn off the shower, you are bam, you are in the now. Um, that's a great time for journaling and for creativity or just getting your day going. Uh, and then um, start your day with a very uh, fairly decent sized protein rich breakfast. Um, protein and good fat is gonna be much better for you. I was uh, actually able to come around to the, some of the cafes here and they've got some fantastic options here at Google for you to be able to do something like that. You wanna avoid carbs in the morning, even though they taste really good. There's a lot of data to show that carbs make you sleepy. And so if you're a wolf and you don't do well in mornings anyway, a bagel is about the worst thing that you could possibly put into your body because all, it wants to do, all your body wants to do after something like that is sleep. And so with that, I will open it up for questions. Um, you can ask me questions about timing. You can ask me questions about sleep, whatever you want. You were just mentioning about some protein-rich uh, breakfast options, and what would those be? So if I was looking for a protein-rich breakfast, I might consider something like an omelet with avocado would be a great option because you get the good fat from the avocado and you get the protein from the eggs. Um, a lot of people, for example, a lot of my people who are night people like wolves, they have almost no appetite in the morning. So for those people, a protein shake or a, you know, a protein smoothie would actually work out pretty well. Yeah, I hate eating in the morning. Yeah, and so do I. And so the only thing I can literally choke down is a smoothie, barely. Yeah. Okay. So that's what I do. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, just curious, like, uh, is it just the genetics, hundred percent, that decides the chronotype, or are there any external factors or social factors? So it's the genetics that determine the the chronotype, but it's the external factors as whether or not you can follow the chronotype. Also, it changes over time. So, as an example, with my daughter, she's thirteen, so she's going to be more of a wolf, um, but. As she gets older, she might be more of a bear, she might be more of a lion, things like that. We also know that as we get even older, like when we hit senior years, like 55, 65, that kind of age range, then we also start to see people go one of two routes. They either go in towards the lion, so you see a lot of people having dinner at five o'clock and getting up super early, or they go towards a dolphin um, because they become more medically frail. Um, there's more medications on board which can be disruptive to sleep. You said that for bears, uh, afternoon exercise is best, but if they don't exercise in the morning, it's not going to happen. Right. That's totally me. Um, <laughs> why is that the case, and how is it different for the others? So it's interesting when we look at exercise in particular, but there's also a motivation factor, right, uh, an, an adherence to exercise. And so there's some data to now suggest that if you do something for t between 21 and 25 days, it becomes a habit. And so what I, what I found with my bears is if they're not willing to do it in the afternoon, which again is where their strength rhythm is coming from, not necessarily fat burning, but strength or, or and not necessarily muscle growth, then I, I, I can convince them sometimes at least to do it in the morning. And then slowly I try to get them to do it towards the afternoon and they actually find that their performance is better. What do you think about napping during afternoons um, so, in general? So generally I love napping unless you're a dolphin. If you're a dolphin or you have any level of insomnia, napping is about the worst thing that you could do because it, again, lowers that sleep drive and makes it difficult to sleep. But a 25-minute nap works really well, and the Napa Latte works really well um, if you try that. But I'm a big fan of the nap, but you want to keep it short. Anybody here ever take a nap and feel worse when they got up from the nap? That means you nap too long. So if you keep it to that 25-minute range, you only get about st some stage one and stage two sleep, and it makes it easier to wake up. Yes, over here. So, so if you had to do just one thing uh -huh. and you were stuck between forced to get up too early for a long commute, mm -hmm. forced to stay up too late just to keep on top of the house and help the kids with homework, mm -hmm. right? You know, no, not a lot of option to change schedules. Right? So it's really over constrained, like I think many of us. Right. What's the one first thing you do to, to make it better? I would keep your sleep schedule the same on the weekends as during the week because what ends up, so you're crunched. 
from both ends is what you're, you're the, the, the description that you're giving me is I got to stay up late to get stuff done and then I got to get up early because I've got a decent sized commute. So you've got this here. So lots of people in that scenario try to catch up on sleep on the weekends. And what ends up happening is they actually shift their circadian clock and make it worse. So I'd rather you keep your schedule as consistent. So if you wake up at, let's say, 6.30 during the week, I'd ask you to wake up at 6.30 on the weekends as well, which I know is not a popular idea. But what you'll find is you can fall asleep more quickly, and you'll be able to get into deeper sleep faster and stay there longer the more consistent your sleep schedule is. So that would be the first thing I would say is keep your bedtime and wake time consistent. Um, the other thing I would do is look at your coffee intake. Um, and see if you can tweak that a little bit because if you've got a commute and you're riding a vehicle or something like that, maybe carpooling might be better um, because of your reaction time is definitely going to be slower, for sure. My question, though, is what's the effect size here on some of these? You're saying better, mm -hmm. and I, I basically want to know how much better my sex is going to be. Okay, so you want to know how much better your sex is going to be. So that's a great question. So what we, it, it really looks more at, so in sex in particular, it's looking more at desire. And so when is desire around? And so... It, it's hard to quantify exactly, but here's one of, the, one of the things I can tell you, and it's great that you chose sex in particular, is we know that the preponderance of men wake up with an erection, right? And so if that's the case, clearly Mother Nature is saying, this is the time that you need to be doing this particular activity. So what I would say is, I'm going to actually put it back onto you. And so what I'm going to ask you to do is, I want you to run the experiment for me, and then let us know if it's increased your sex life any more or less, and we'll see what happens. But the, the, right now, the data isn't that clear. Um, but when we look at these things and we say things are better, what we're finding is anecdotally, a tremendous number of people are, I, I get hundreds of emails of people saying, holy cow, this, is, this really is interesting. And I don't want people to change their whole lives, right? I want them to get their sleep schedule down and then just pick one thing from the book. There are literally 50 different activities. Most people look at the sex part first, but if then that's what you want to do, go for it. But um, you'll be surprised at it. It ab ab absolutely is incrementally better. What is your opinion on polyphasic sleep and how does it differ from adaptive sleep habits? For example, habitual napping at a set time per day. So for those of you out there that don't know what polyphasic sleep is, so this is an idea where you can get your eight hours in about four and a half, right? So everybody's ears perk up, oh, how do I do that? So what you end up doing is you have a core amount of sleep, usually three sleep cycles, about four and a half hours, and then you take uh, 25 to 35 minute naps at very particular times throughout the day, and that can be the most extreme situation where you would actually reduce total sleep time by about 200 minutes. Um, Here's the pros and the cons of doing something like that. Yes, you do get more time, but you don't really. So here's what goes on is, first of all, you're awake when almost everybody out there is asleep. So there's only so many things you can do on the internet to talk to somebody in a different country where you're kind of done with that aspect. It, it turns out you get very lonely. Also, if you have any proclivity for depression, it comes out in spades. Um, because what you're doing is you're really sleep depriving the body. Now the body can handle only so much of that. Everybody that I've ever worked with who wanted to do a polyphasic sleep schedule um, stopped within three months because you can't even do dinner in a movie, right? You can go out and then your hour and a half to three hours is up when you have to take your next nap. And so it really becomes socially very difficult to do. Probably a lot of new moms and dads out there. Yes. Um, Advice for them. Yeah. You know, I, I remember something, you know, nap and the baby naps, but like, what are your top three tips for new moms and dads? So new moms and new dads. So first of all, I, this is, and it, it all depends upon your baby, right? So we had two colicky babies. So both of my kids had tremendous reflux um, to the point where we had to have them on compounded Prilosec um, to be able to keep them in a good spot. And so their sleep became, was erratic until we did that. We actually did that fairly early on and we got both of our kids to sleep fairly easily. There's a great program out there. Um, it's called BabyWise. That's what we used in our house, and it's an eat, sleep, play program, and it's really about the consistency of the schedule. Kids sleep invariably doesn't get messed up. It's their parents that don't keep a good, strict sleep schedule. So when grandma and grandpa's in town, don't keep them up later. If grandma and grandpa's flight got in at eight o'clock, they don't get to see the kids that night. You know, you don't keep them up for that situation because you end up with what is termed in our house a meltdown, right? And that's a whole lot of no fun for everybody. So the con more consistent the schedule is, the better. That's number, uh, number one. Number two, if you do have a situation where you've got a child that isn't sleeping particularly well, you should use what I call as an on-call system. So one, one uh, partner has Monday, Wednesday, Friday. The other partner has Tuesday, um, Thursday, Saturday, and then Sunday, you flip a coin. 
And that's, so if, if the baby is crying, that individual is responsible for that, as opposed to both people waking up, not getting enough sleep. So that has a tendency to work. Or if you've got one person who's a lion and one person who's a wolf, you can take different shifts that way where the lion can get up early and the wolf can stay up late. That has a tendency to work as well. So it's really about managing your time surrounding that situation and checking out that baby-wise. It's pretty good. But uh, Tom from the other side of Mountain View says, how long does it take to train your body for a new sleeping routine? So it's interesting. Um, if it's a sleeping routine that works with your chronotype and your genetics, then it doesn't take very long. It'll adapt in usually five to seven days. If you're trying to go against your chronotype, so let's say you're a wolf and you're trying to be a lion, it could take months to be able to do that. And to be very honest with you, it's not gonna be particularly successful. You really should try to stick, that's why it's great to be a bear, because bears kind of have it in the best spot because they can kind of move. And remember, you can be a bear that wakes up a little bit early or a bear that stays up a little bit late. Um, so if you're following your chronotype, it's not hard to snap back into it, but when you're going against your chronotype, it, it can take a long time and it isn't necessarily very successful. Well, thank you all very much. I really enjoyed being here.